kicking off episode 556 of the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes the not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear with the song Moon Relay. It's from the band The Cronchong Devils from their album Action. You can find them at cronchongdevils.bandcamp.com. They're a surf band out of the Netherlands, and I'll make sure there's a link in the show notes when you're done listening to this episode of Monster Kid Radio. My name is Derek M. Cook. I'd like to welcome you to the show and tell you that I'm super excited to get into this week's episode. I mean, I'm excited every week. I don't think there's any secret there, surprise. I'm excited for the podcast each and every week. Part of the reason why I keep going. But this week, we're talking about a vampire movie that really got my monster blood pumping. We're talking about the movie The Vampire and the Ballerina from 1960. This is a movie that I'd never seen before watching it specifically for this episode of the podcast. So this was a first time thing for me. However, the guest this week is not a first timer. It's Robert Kelly from Record All Monsters, which is an awesome podcast. He's going to tell you about that. And we're going to talk about The Vampire and the Ballerina. And we're going to talk about an upcoming appearance that I have on his podcast. Or maybe it's already out yet. I don't know. Either way, it's happening this week. You're going to hear me on Record All Monsters. But check that out when you're done listening to this episode, because not only do we have the vampire and the ballerina, we have Kenny's look at famous monsters of Filmland, knocking it out of the park as always. And the time has come. The Beta Capsule Review from Mark Matsky. It is the final episode of the original Ultraman. I have had a really good time enjoying the Beta Capsule Review from Mark. I can't wait to see what he does next, or I guess specifically hear what he does next. So speaking of hearing what's coming up next, we got this. John Drew Barrymore as the mad master of the black arts, using every evil means in his desire to conquer the world. Tomorrow you will present Lucilius and his generals my vestal virgins. Enslaved women did his bidding. Soldiers were transformed into mindless puppets of the goddess of zombies. The goddess who punishes with fire and mummifies with the power of her evil third eye. Spectacle as big as the eye can perceive. Azir! Azir! The Romans are coming! What? of internationally famous actors. A production that is unparalleled for its breathtaking costumes and scenic effects based upon historical documents to be presented soon in this theater. The Loves of Hercules, a truly exceptional film in cinemascope and Eastman color. Produced by Alberto Manca, under the experienced and accurate direction of Carlo Ludovico Bragaglia. Hercules, son of Jupiter, is victorious in the most spectacular exploits beyond the powers of human beings. Played by Mickey Hargerty, whose powerful and statuesque physique is superbly adapted to his winning performance. Jane Mansfield, Blonde and fascinating actress of 20th Century Fox, 
one of the most beautiful women of the international screen, in the double role of Deyanira and Hippolyta, brings to the film the entire range of her talent as an actress and her feminine fascination. Massimo Serrato, the brilliant Italian actor who brings you his incomparable performance of the complex and difficult part of Lico, which will long remain in your memory for its power. And other outstanding actors well known to you. Rosella Como, faithful handmaiden to Deyanira. Tina Gloriani, rising star of the cinema as the queen of the Amazons. Arturo Bragaglia, forceful and convincing in the character role of Yolau. René Dari, unforgettable interpreter of Grisby with Jean Gabin. And Giulio Donini, Moira Orfe, Andrea Scotti, Andrea Aureli, Sandrine, and a host of others whom you have admired in numerous films. The Loves of Hercules. You will gasp at the amazing and terrifying mythological monster, the fearful Hydra of the Gates of the Inferno, the first creation of its kind of such great dimensions and accuracy of movement. The gigantic monster of the Cave of Death. The spectacular and frightful Valley of the Human Trees, desperately wailing for a return to life. The reconstruction of the city of Icalia with its powerful and forbidding walls and hundreds of other fascinating and astounding features. The Loves of Hercules. A co-production, Grandi Schermi Italiani SPA, contact organization PIP. Produced in the studios of Cinecita. The Loves of Hercules. Soon in this theater. Live from the Land of Light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty Ultra Heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. Could it really be true? The time has come to say farewell Ultraman in the 39th and final episode of the series. The story begins with apocalyptic news. A fleet of flying saucers are sweeping in from space and at the time of detection are 40 minutes away from a full-scale invasion. Entering the Earth's atmosphere, they proceed directly to Japan, intent on taking out the Science Patrol and Ultraman first, leading Professor Iwamoto to declare, our defeat means the defeat of the planet. Fight for the lives of the Japan branch. However, when he remembers a new weapon the Science Patrol could use in battle, he races off, only to be abducted by an enemy already inside headquarters. Inhabiting the professor's body, the intruder chokes Fuji and destroys the communications center. The Science Patrol air defense defeats most of the alien fleet, but returns to find HQ in disarray. Fortunately, a revived Fuji names the professor as her assailant, Arashi locates and tackles him, and he transforms into an alien before their eyes. At the moment, Hayata shoots the alien and utters the word Zeton, and one more flying saucer appears, from which bursts a fearsome monster bent on destroying headquarters. Using the Beta Capsule, Hayata becomes Ultraman, who fights valiantly in defense of the Japan branch, but, incredibly, Zeton prevails. Ultraman cannot rise one last time. Arashi eliminates the alien monster with Iwamoto's prototype bullet as the fallen Ultraman remembers his battles on Earth. What will become of our hero from the Land of Light and Hayata, whose life is linked to his? Farewell Ultraman still has the power to shock first-time viewers 
and move longtime fans. It threads the needle of giving this iteration of Ultraman a definitive ending while opening the door for future series to launch. The truth of the matter is that Ultraman was a ratings monster and Tokyo Broadcasting System wanted more episodes, but the good folks at Tsuburaya Productions said no. They were wiped out after making 28 episodes of Ultra Q, followed by 39 for Ultraman, in a virtually unbroken string. They needed a break. Farewell Ultraman aired in early April of 1967, and the crew took some time to regroup. But before too long, all sights were set on October of the same year for the planned debut of Ultra 7. So, we bid farewell to Ultraman, the show at the vanguard of the mid-late 60s monster boom, the origin of a franchise still going strong 55 years later, based on the simple premise that there might be a giant hero hiding inside of you. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Mansky reporting. Giant monsters. Godzilla, Ebira, and Mothra in one of the most explosive action pictures ever to hit the screen. From the depths of the ocean comes the most terrifying horror of the deep. Within the mountain caves comes the dreaded monster Godzilla. See the most titanic battle ever screened when the monster of the deep challenges the mighty Godzilla. Hello there, Monster Kid Radioheads. This is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. Today's film, The Vampire and the Ballerina, was featured in FM 46 from September of 1967. It was a six-page article with six photos. Let's take a look at what it had to say. A 2,000-year-old horror legend was brought to life on the screen in 1961. From Italy it came. Dubbed into English and Squeamish, the letter is a yell of a language that's not for the Squeamish. They called it a switch on the vampire theme that makes Count Dracula look like an amateur. A spook and scarum melodrama, a hair-raising tale of a bloodlusting fiend, victims for the vampire queen. Just as in the good old days of film fright, the producers promised the vampire and the ballerina, a ballerina is a female dancer, has a full house of gothic castles filled with sinister counts and even more menacing countesses and shudder slinky servants and 
creepy music. All this mystery takes place in the midst of dark and eerie forests. The rest of the article is a brief, spoiler-filled synopsis. Inspired by Derek's choice and its appearance in FM, I decided to watch this film that has eluded me for 50 years. Wasn't bad. That is all for this week's look at Famous Monsters. We will have more next week. For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. Ages ago, in a long-lost part of the world, the Mayans worshipped a terrifying goddess. To her, men offered their strength and their devotion. Women offered the beauty of their bodies. <coughs> Al Tiki, the immortal monster. Today, courageous adventurers, dedicated scientists of both sexes, begin the exploration of recently discovered caverns buried in the very womb of the earth. <coughs> From space beyond space comes force beyond measurement, energizing this monstrous mass of man-eating protoplasm that devours every living thing it touches. When her mate appears in the sky, the power of Kaltiki will destroy the world. You can believe what you like. Kaltiki's been reborn. All civilians are to remain in their homes until further order. Every precaution has been taken to combat the danger the city faces. And all citizens are urged to remain can anything on this earth stop Cal Tiki, the immortal monster? I am Dr. Lee Cushing. Welcome to my Chamber of Horrors. Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors is a monster rally novel in the tradition of the classic Universal and Hammer horror film. It's written by Stephen D. Sullivan, the award-winning author of White Zombie, Daikaiju Attack, Manos the Hands of Fate, and one of the creators of the original chill role-playing game. This book recreates the thrills of the classic monster vs. monster film. We've got vampires, werewolves, mummies, psychic twins, scheming madmen, and plenty of unexpected chills. Now you can get Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors in print or for Kindle at Amazon.com and other fine retailers. Coming soon in other ebook formats. Find out more at CushingHorrors.com or SDSullivan.com and support Steve's work through Patreon at PaySteve.com. I do hope you've enjoyed your visit. Please come again. And remember, the chamber is always waiting for its next victim. I am Dracula, and I bid you welcome to the podcast devoted to the classic, and sometimes not so classic, genre cinema of yesteryear. And I offer you this warning. Sometimes Derek and his guests get excited, and they may spoil a movie or two. You know how excited monster kids can get sometimes. If Monster Kid Radio spoils a movie for you, do not come whining to me. I cannot stand whines. Monster Kid Radio listeners, I love discovering new movies. I love finding movies from the era that we typically cover on Monster Kid Radio that I've never seen. And so when Robert Kelly posted on, I think it was Facebook, that he was watching The Vampire and the Ballerina, I knew I had to talk about that movie because I've never seen it, despite the fact that I own it on Blu-ray. So I busted out the Blu-ray. I gave it a watch. I got a hold of Robert. And we are finally talking about that movie here on the show. Welcome to the show. Record all monsters. Robert Kelly. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, Derek. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. And I'm excited to finally talk to you again. It's been a while, at least six months, according to Skype. <laughs> yeah, it's been a, been a minute. I know we've probably emailed and stuff between then and now, but... It's always nice to actually talk to you. For sure. And it makes a better podcast anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I suppose I could just read our emails, but that's not, you know. 
But speaking of podcasting, you recently launched season two of Record All Monsters, which is one of my favorite kaiju centric podcasts. Tell tell people about it if they haven't heard me gush about it or <laughs> aren't familiar with what you do. What is Record All Monsters? Well, first of all, thank you. And second of all, Record All Monsters is a, a kaiju podcast where we look at the history of giant monster movies, you know, in chronological order. So we started with season one. We went from King Kong up to War of the Gargantuas. We started our second season recently. We had to take a little bit of a break just due to some logistic stuff. We got episodes out on Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster with John LeMay. And we got an episode on Gamera vs. Gauss. And uh, Derek, I think you're going to be on uh, our next episode. Yeah, okay, I'm going to peel back the curtain, sure. Yeah, as soon as we get done, as soon as we're done talking about the vampire and the ballerina listeners, we're going to talk about a kaiju film for Robert's podcast. Do we want to say what it is? Yeah, we can say it's going to be The Extra Matter Space. Which is one of my all-time favorite kaiju films, and I can't wait to talk to Robert about it. <laughs> so, always thrilled to have Derek on. I'm always thrilled to be on Monster Kid Radio. I'm wearing my shirt right now, actually, I didn't realize. Oh, nice! Uh, the Toho logo one. <laughs> it's great! It's one of my favorites on your store. That's awesome. Uh, my Record All Monsters t-shirt's in the laundry, actually, otherwise I would have been representing. <laughs> Sorry, man. So, of course, we're talking about T-shirts that you can pick up. Uh, you're on Public as well, right? It's Public for both yep. of us. Yep. And there's a link in the show notes to Monster Kid Radio's Public shop. And, you know, by the time this is all done, we'll make sure there's links to everything. Record all monsters there as well to go check that out. Well, we are going to talk about the vampire and the ballerina. We are going to talk about monster movies and get into it. But, you know, there's something we do on every episode of Monster Kid Radio that I have really enjoyed getting back to after that stint where I had Steve Turek as the guest host and I wasn't doing the actual main part of the show. I miss doing the Classic Five with folks. So it's time for a round of the Classic Five. Are you ready, sir? I'm very ready. The Classic Five. The Classic Five is a game that we play on the show. It's a deck of cards normally uh, that I will draw from. Each card has a this or that, which movie do you prefer style question on them. There are no wrong answers. It's just a way to get monster kids talking, get to know each other a little bit better, that sort of thing. I still have not unpacked my box of Classic Five cards. I have no idea where they are, so I am reading these off an Excel spreadsheet. (laughs) <laughs> that I'm just kind of, I'd say I'm picking them randomly, but that's not true. These are going to be pretty vampire centric. Wonderful. All right, here we go. Card number one, question number one. Who do you think would have made a better Dracula, Boris Karloff or Vincent Price? Oh, man, that's actually pretty tough. Oh, uh, Vincent Price is my guy, but I would really like to see Karloff take that. I, I feel fairly confident that we know what a, a Vincent Price Dracula would look like. But I, I'm I'm very interested what would what would a Karloff one look like. So I think I'm gonna have to go Karloff. Especially a younger Karloff. You know, that kind mm-hmm. of dashing kind of look yeah. Ooh. I like it. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think we probably would know what Vince, if we just think about it, we know what Vincent Price's Dracula would look like and sound like mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. So yeah, okay, cool. Question number two, which country made the better vampire movies, Mexico or Italy? Oh, (laughs) now that, that is a fun one. Uh Um, that is a fun one. I I'm going to have to go, I think with my heritage and say Mexico, I love me some Mexican vampire movies. El vampire, uh, one of the all time great came out the same year as uh, horror of Dracula. I think Mm -hmm. I remember I, my family and I were scrolling through Netflix a few years ago and that was on there. And I was like, stop, everybody stop. We're, <laughs> <laughs> we're watching this tonight. <laughs> nice. No one else enjoyed it as much as I did, but <laughs> well, I think as monster kids, we're kind of used to that, aren't we? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so I think I'll go Mexico, but there, there are some Italian vampire movies that I really enjoy too. I love Mexico's vampire output. Sometimes they are just so over the top campy. Sometimes they are so melodramatic. I love them. Yeah. Yeah. And they have that, that weird kind of sort of Gothic tra- Yeah. It's just so good. But like you said, the Italian stuff's good too. Yeah. I, I love it all, you know, but so we need an, like an Italian Mexican fusion kind of Dracula <laughs> offering. All right. Well, okay. Here's an old standard, an old standby Christopher Lee or Bela Lugosi. Who do you prefer as Dracula? You're giving me hard ones today. I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> so I feel like 
Christopher Lee plays Dracula almost like a big cat. Like, uh, yeah, he does. He just kind of paces around and then attacks you. Mm -hmm. Very little going on there. I feel Bela's is more, more human. Like there's this, you always see the gears turning. And I think I find that a little more, uh, just a little more compelling, but it's hard. It's hard to pick, but I think I'm going to barely give Bela the edge. You know, I'm on team Bela over here. I love yeah. Christopher Lee. He played Dracula, what, eight, nine, eight times. More times than Bela did on screen. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he, he does great with it, but that's a really good way to put it. I, I've always viewed him as a little bit more animalistic and well, a cat's a, an animal. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. Question number four. What is your favorite way to see a vampire destroyed on screen? I, I do like when they get melted in the sun. We're going to talk about that a little bit, I guess, spoilers maybe. But there's so many great vampires in the sun moments. So I think that's generally my favorite. But I think my favorite vampire on-screen death is uh, from the, the beginning of Dracula, A.D. 1972. Mm, yeah, with the wagon wheel? With the wagon wheel. Yes. I really like that one, but I think in general, my favorite is the sun. It's iconic. When, whenever you see it, it's iconic. I, I'm a big fan of uh, the uh, inadvertent cross that is formed by the shadow of the windmill in Brides oh, of Dracula. That is a good one, too. Oh, I love that. When, when something like that comes out of left field, man, just, oh, that was great. All right, final question. Other than Dracula or any of the Dracula films, what's your favorite vampire movie? We watched a whole lot of vampire movies recently, my Mm -hmm. My wife and I, uh, we watched like Fright Night and The Lost Boys, and we watched The Vampire Lovers. And they're all just running in my head right now. <laughs> like, but oh, then I'm blanking on the name. It's a Hammer one. The one that started out off as the Dracula sequel. Was it that the, uh, the Kiss of the Vampire? Kiss of the Vampire, they wanted to have Cushion come in as Van Helsing, but he didn't want to do... Van Helsing doing magic stuff. Is that what you're right. thinking about? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably my favorite non Dracula vampire movie. They just, they feel like genuine threats. The characters are compelling. You're worried about them. And their, their Van Helsing analog is, a, is a lot of fun. Listen to the flight of the vampire bat summoned from Hades to kill, to destroy. See kiss of the vampire in color. I'd probably go with something like twins of evil, but not for, what people think but <laughs> peter cushing is amazing in that he's so. very good oh i mean he's worse than the vampires than that <laughs> <laughs> all right well that was the classic five vampire edition and the reason i made the question so hard is because you always try to stump me when i come on your show so uh <laughs> i i realize i probably just karmically doomed myself to my appearance on your show here in a little bit but <laughs> well your questions have been set in stone for for a long time since i wrote the episode back in uh -oh. back over the summer <laughs> so we'll uh -oh. see how they wound up <laughs> All the terror of the unknown reaches out from forgotten centuries. And a horror legend 2,000 years old comes alive as a hideous demon rises from the grave to bring a new high in horror to the motion picture screen. The Vampire and the Ballerina. No one is safe from this monster of the night, this creature from the crypt of the living dead who stalks the countryside in search of victims for his insatiable bloodlust. The Vampire and the Ballerina. Into the evil domain of the Vampire King comes a company of beautiful dancers. And the most desirable of them all is the ballerina. Helpless in the grip of his satanic power that brings everlasting enslavement to her soul. The scream has never reached such heights of fright, such soul-shivering suspense, such heart-stopping horror. You will remember for always the startling, haunting motion picture. The Vampire and the Ballerina. 
So like I said at the top of this, I owned the Blu-ray. There was a period of time where I was picking up and I was being irresponsible with my money, but I was picking up Blu-rays and DVDs the minute some studio or some distribution company said, hey, we've got it, we're remastering it, we're putting a commentary track, we're doing something on it. Typically, it was Kino Lorber, um, <laughs> you know, and I would snatch that stuff up. And Vampire and the Ballerina was one of those. And then it sat in my collection and just sat there. I have so many movies, and I'm sure a lot of listeners, if not you yourself, have movies in your collection that you picked up for those reasons and they just never got around to watching. Yeah. And this is one of them for me. So I've been sitting on it, but for you, how did you come across it? We live in central Texas and near Austin. And there's a, a, a record store in Austin called Waterloo records. And they also have a wonderful cult DVD and Blu-ray section. Okay. And all that's where I go first. Like I'm a big music lover but this is the only place you can find a lot of these movies without going online. Okay. So it's kind of like video store vibes for me. And so I'll head back there to the cult DVD section and I'll just pour over every title. And I saw this one. I, I brought it with me. The audience can't see it, but <laughs> nice. <laughs> I just saw the title and I was like, I haven't heard of that. It's from shout factory. Okay. And I pull it out. And the first thing I see is on the back cover. There's a, Burnett lady in a nightgown showing off a lot of leg. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let's see what it's about. <laughs> All right. Hey, you but know. <laughs> when, when, when I read the back, I was like, oh, that actually does sound really interesting. And whenever my wife and I go there, we both end up with giant piles of stuff. And we have to meet somewhere to be like, okay, spending limit and how many things. Like, yeah. Just... <laughs> And we whittled it down, like, because we show each other the piles and we say, you shouldn't get that. You shouldn't get that. <laughs> she thought it looked interesting, too. So it was one of the things we came away with. And we didn't watch it until this past Halloween, this past October. And uh, we were both really surprised by it. We we didn't expect to enjoy it as much as we did. So it was released by Shout Factory. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to correct myself about the whole Kino thing. <laughs> uh, Shout Factory put it out on Blu-ray in 2018, which is when I bought it. And I don't think there's a commentary track on it, but it is a high definition transfer. Yes. You know, it, it's supposed to look as good as it ever has. And it does. I think the transfer does look really nice. It is a beautiful black and white Gothic oh, cinematography. It's it just, really is. and I'm, I'm shocked or I'm not shocked. This isn't the right word. I'm disappointed in myself for having not watched it sooner mm -hmm. because the imagery of this, especially in the back half, the second half of the film, Yes. Oh man, it's it's gorgeous. The pacing is amazing. Uh, the music, you know, just all of it comes together for me. I struggled a little bit at the beginning. Uh, the I, I the thought, beginning is slow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought it was a little like um, we really are just going to watch a vampire movie with a whole bunch of dancing women and leotards, aren't we? And that's all <laughs> we're going to see. And there is a lot of it. But it's not all there is. Uh, it, right. It does kind of get on with the business of the movie eventually. But there's, See, there's a lot of leotard yeah. dancing women. <laughs> there are. I'm, I'm actually a very big fan of dance. So I, watching the dancing, well, even just beyond like the jokes we could make about it. But the, the dancing is actually very good. And so Suspiria is one of my favorite movies. Okay. But there's very little dancing in it. And it takes place at a ballet academy. Which is the only flaw I have with it. Only problem I have with it. Okay. This, it was nice to see, even if it's not necessarily ballet, some actual very skilled dancing, but very little ballet. I do love ballet. <laughs> it, it, well, and my girlfriend dances ballet. Ball, she's a ballerina. So I was watching this with an eye for that, thinking, okay, maybe this is the one thing I can show her. There's a little tiny bit, but it quickly... Devolve isn't the right word because it sounds like I'm saying it goes down a notch and it doesn't, but it, it transitions to like a free form jazz kind of dance. Yeah. And that's cool too. And they are pretty skilled and, and the sequences it's pretty girls and leotards. Cool. But the sequences are actually <laughs> well shot and choreographed as well. So yeah. it's more than just a, a cash grab or an exploitation trick. Yeah, but it is. it does become kind of a problem for the movie's pacing in the front half. Mm -hmm. Just because you're like, well, we had a vampire attack right at the beginning, and now we're on our third dance scene. And uh, <laughs> Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> but then it picks up again. 
I, I think even if you're not someone who, who enjoys dance, it's worth going through that part. Oh, yeah. For sure, because, I mean, that's what the characters are. It's not something that's just thrown in there to be like, hey, let's look at the pretty girls. The movie takes place where this is happening. It's it's organic to the story, to the plot. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not a, something that's kind of been shoehorned in or whatever. Uh, the story itself, the plot is actually pretty simple, I feel like. It, it's yeah. vampire plaguing. Well, I love the Internet Movie Database synopsis. A troop of young, beautiful dancers find themselves stranded in a sinister, spooky old castle, not knowing that it is a home to a group of vampires. That, that's pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much it. That's, that's uh, there's just a about it. Vampire lives in an old castle, and he's turning some of the girls, and he gets younger and then older when he needs to. Yeah, it's pretty much it. It's very basic. But it looks so cool, especially when they start showing off the castle. Yeah, mm. I don't know where they shot it. I know nothing about the movie, but I really liked its, its use of its location. I was trying to do some more research on it. There's very little information available for this movie. And, you know, I mean, you've listened to Record All Monsters. You know, I like to really dive deep into right. getting some information. I couldn't find a whole lot about this. I do know that they did film on location at a medieval castle in Italy. But okay. that was one of the very few things I could find. The director, uh, Renato Polselli, he started out making kind of like crime movies based around dancers. Oh, okay. This was his first supernatural one. And his career gets really weird and kind of gross after that in the 70s. But just everything bad you've heard about Italian genre movies, he, he wound <laughs> up playing into. Yeah. Uh, oh, later. God. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm still traumatized by the accidental inclusion of one of those movies on the Saturday stream that I host oh, no. without, without knowing what I was getting into. And it was, uh, and I've talked about it before. It was a movie called bell from hell. Uh, and, uh, it, uh, has a guy learning how to chop people up by working at a slaughterhouse. And we see all the slaughterhouse action and I oh, was God. not happy. I oh, was traumatized. Man. So yeah, I, I am now very careful about <laughs> what I show. Well, in uh, European genre, well, not even genre, European cinema, the lower budget stuff gets pretty skeevy there for yeah. a while. The low budget stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I, I have the, uh, the shout factory, uh, Paul Nashy box sets. Uh huh. And I'd seen most of those movies before, but in like their U S release versions, I was just shocked at all the animal uh. stuff. Uh, that that was very disappointing. It's it's hard to watch. I like Paul Nashie. I don't know as much as I should, as much as people like Rod or Steve or those. But mm-hmm. yeah, some of those films, uh, Blue Eyes of the Broken Doll is notoriously known for having some stuff in it. I think I, I yes. have never watched it for that reason because well, I that was I've been avoiding that it. was the first one that I popped in because I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Yeah, like forty minutes to an hour in. Just out of nowhere. Um, hmm. But, uh, uh, yeah, I try not to, I try to make a point of not watching movies with that yeah. in it. it. It was a different time. Values were different. I don't know if that excuses it, but. It is my understanding that in, in Blue Eyes with the Broken Doll, they actually used the animal to feed the cast and crew. So, I'd, I'd, I'd heard that. I don't know how true it is. But like I, yeah, I've, I've worked, uh, on ranches before and like, I have an under, I'm not squeamish. I have an understanding. I just think it's gross to film that stuff. So let's talk about dancing girls to get back into the movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, b- before we leave his career, I, I know nothing about this guy. Um, I was trying to learn a little bit more about him. It looks like he maybe did two or three other pure genre films, but then the rest of it. I know nothing about, but it looks like he wrote a Django spaghetti Western. So, you know, that's yes. something he wrote two and he directed one. Okay. And the one he directed, he actually took over from someone else because they got bored with it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it's, I haven't seen it, but reading the description, it was pretty rote. It was like a high noon, except the reason he's hesitant is because uh, his brother is in the gang. Oh, so, okay. 
I've talked about it. People know that I love me a good spaghetti Western. I apparently love me a bad spaghetti Western too, but I, I love spaghetti Westerns. Me too. But the plots are not deep. <laughs> <laughs> No. There's a reason why you can call them all Django films, even though they're not Django films. They're pretty mm-hmm. interchangeable. <laughs> I still love the heck out of them, but yeah. So I, I hear you say it. that the guy was bored with it. Just like, come on. <laughs> well, you knew what you were making, right? I mean, <laughs> <sighs> yeah, that was that was all I wanted to bring up about his career, that he just, like a lot of Italian genre directors of his time, did a little bit of everything. Yeah. But other other than that, I couldn't find much on this movie. The, the other title that has my attention is The Monster of the Opera, which, again, deals with a theater troupe. I, I've never mm-hmm. seen it, but I'm just looking at... What? Okay, this is the synopsis for The Monster of the Opera. Theater troupe's young, energetic leader has secured an old theater in which to produce his new production. Fine, blah, 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 blah. A vampire is awakened and discovers <laughs> that one of the troupe is the reincarnation of the woman he once loved. Okay, well, so we had a thing for vampires and theatrics? I guess I, I kind of do want to see that, even if it. <laughs> yeah, it sounds Me pretty t- interesting. But Me too. But something I really liked about this movie, they had something that was kind of novel, that I wasn't expecting, and I don't think I've seen it in any other vampire movie, where the the male vampire is almost like a drone for the the vampire queen. Like he goes out, and he feeds, and then he comes back to her, and she feeds off of him. I thought that was really cool too. That relationship, that uh, symbiosis, symbiotic relationship they had, I thought was really neat. I don't know if that's really quite the right term for it, but I exactly what you're describing. It's something I don't think I've seen. I mean, we've seen men be subservient to women vampires. We've seen that, right. but but the feeding and the way the 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 life energy, the blood is transferred, is just that was cool. That was really interesting and something I was absolutely fascinated by. I think it'd be great to see that explored more in uh, other uh, vampire movies. Joshua Kennedy. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'm looking to get back into the game sometime this year. I'll make a note. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> There's a great special feature on here. It's like the only one. They have the eight millimeter reel that they used to sell, like, you know how they used to sell little eight millimeter reels of action from genre movies and stuff. Yeah. They have the scene that was in that reel when they released it in the U S and it's okay. when, he, when the male vampire comes back and is fed on and it has subtitles that have nothing to do with the movie. It, <laughs> it's kind of wonderful. I've watched it several times just because it's just a weird little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I love those old like castle films, the old eight millimeter films. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I love that they would sometimes give them titles that have nothing to do with where the movie or where it actually came from. I get really excited when I stumble across something like Dracula versus the Wolfman. Oh, well that sounds cool. No, it's just a castle film clip from Abbott and you'll sell me Dracula yeah. Yeah. or something like that. But still, you know, it's kind of neat to see how they marketed that stuff. So Huh, I, need, I do need to explore the Blu-ray a little bit more. Uh, there's not much on it to explore, but again, the transfer looks great. The story does pick up in the second half, and just like with the director, I don't know very much about the cast, the crew, any of them. I researched as best I could, too, and I couldn't find anything either outside of what's on Wikipedia in the Internet Movie Database. Which, yeah, which isn't a lot. Yeah, and, and who knows how really accurate that is anyway. So, especially when it comes to like foreign imports and things like that, the title of the movie strictly translates to the vampire's lover ballerina. Yeah. yeah, It's not even part of the the original Italian title. So I guess I can't be too upset. There wasn't a lot of ballet, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but I do like the performance and the look of the vampire. Uh, He does. Uh, especially the male vampire, he does go from young to old to young. He goes back and forth. And the makeup they used to indicate his age, I thought worked really well for what this movie was. Yes. It's kind of like a uh, almost predecessor to like the Emperor Palpatine. Yeah. Kind of like like the heavy, heavy cheeks and bags Mm -hmm. under the eyes and uh, just like this hollow face, basically. It's really interesting, and especially towards the end when they start doing something similar with the female vampire. 
Yes. As, as she's exposed to the sun in, in the end. And I thought that was kind of cool too, to see. But I think the thing that stands out the most to me, there's two things that stands out the most to me. The ending is cool. It's the sunlight dissolving the vampire. Yeah. We talked a little bit about that earlier. And I got really excited because I, I, I cheated. I looked at Wikipedia a little bit before I watched the movie and I saw this <laughs> whole thing about them making a big deal about putting a plaster cast head and then a rubber mold over that, but packing it with ash in between so that yeah. the ash would spill out. That sounds amazing. And they do, but you don't really see a lot of it. I would have liked to have seen more, but I just want to see that. So, Yeah, no, I it, got pretty excited. It is one of my favorite portrayals of a vampire, you know, dissolving in the sun. Uh, I think the only one I can think of that I like better maybe is Christopher Lee at the end of Horror of Dracula. Mm, that one's good, too. But this this is just like the gooiness of it because they have yeah. the... The, the rubber, the melting under the rubber, act. yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. It's is just gruesome enough that you're you're a little ill, but you yeah. can't stop looking. <laughs> and they keep cutting to the hand, which has been made up to be all gnarled and bony. Mm-hmm. Oh, and that works great as well. I, I wasn't, even though I didn't get to see as much ash as I wanted to see spilling over the place. I still loved it. Yeah. I still thought it was cool. And especially when she starts to transform and fall apart. So there's that moment. But the other thing that I really took away from this is loving. And hearing you say that they actually shot in a real castle, I'm questioning whether or not they actually broke part of the castle to do this. It's when the vampire starts pushing a wall down on top of our hero <laughs> as he's coming up or going down the stairs. I've never seen that. Vampires, yeah, they're super strong. I've seen that. I've never seen them actually destroy the architecture to try to get to somebody. <laughs> that was cool. And it's this old castle awesome. or shop. Oh, man. I'm, that I'm was sure awesome. they were just wrecking the building. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that, because uh, the, the two male leads, one of whom <laughs> is not present for most of the movie, right. and then just shows up at the end to be. You, you notice we're not using anybody's names. I don't think they're important in this movie at all. Yeah, it's yeah. I can't really keep them oh. straight anyway. So yeah, <laughs> there's a the, the tall the tall girl, the short girl, the blonde guy, and the <laughs> the dark haired guy. And the the short girl likes the dark haired guy, and the tall girl <laughs> likes the blonde guy. And uh, the the vampire, the vampire guy gets a. Uh, <laughs> uh, Pretty much. Take, yeah. But it, it's, I mean, I, I feel like people might think we're, we're kind of down on this movie. Not at all. It's so much fun. It really is. You get to hang on through the dancing at the beginning. It, it's well done dancing. It's not what you think of when you think about vampire movies, but stick, stick through it. It's fine. It picks up a lot. And, you know, even saying the second half, I'd say maybe the second two thirds of it yeah. are really good. So it's it's really solid. And even though we're like, yeah, you know, short haired girl, dark haired girl, blonde dude, the performances <laughs> are. Oh God, I don't want to say adequate because that sounds like I'm dismissing it, too. They never took me out of it. I yeah, never felt they, like I was watching a bad actor or actress. So it's uh, it's so, just kind of solid, you know film acting the the blu-ray has the italian uh language track and the english did you watch i want subtitled i want subtitled Uh um i i I didn't mean to uh for a first time watch i didn't know how much time i would have and i'm still kind of dealing with some unpacking and stuff uh, in the living room so my intention was put on the english language track so that i can work on maybe sorting a bookshelf while it's playing Mm-hmm. When I realized I was watching the subtitle track, I was like, "Yeah, it's too, yeah, I'm not going to worry. I don't want to do the bookshelves anyway. So I just sat there and watched yeah. it. So. <laughs> so how about you? I, I've watched it both ways. And okay. I, I'd like to say it makes a remarkably minuscule amount of difference. Okay. Uh, the uh, It's nice to hear the actor's own voices. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's not, not a big deal. I did watch the dub today when I rewatched the movie um, because I was finishing up dinner. But uh, it, yeah, I just, this is a lot of fun and it's 
One one of the few movies uh, my wife Courtney likes to rewatch from my collection. Okay. She used to dance. She loves dance. She loves gothic stuff, vampire stuff. So it, it checks all her boxes and uh, checks a lot of mine. It does have that. You said gothic again, that gothic vibe, that gothic aesthetic, especially when they're at the castle. There are some shots that if it was in color, you'd swear it was a Roger Corman Poe picture. Yes. Oh, especially the female vampire coming down the stairs the first yes, time. They, that's exactly what I'm thinking they about. Come in. Mm-hmm. It looks really good. And I, I know the Italian film industry sometimes is very factory like, you know, just kind of yeah. clock in, do your job, go home, you know, make some art, but make a lot of money along the way if you can. <laughs> so I, I don't know much about the casting crew, but I would like to learn a little bit more if I could about this. So if any listeners know anything more about the movie, I'd love to hear more about it because I thought the cinematography was great. Of course, I'm going to say I love the music because I always do. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I did recognize the composer's uh, name anyway, because he's done a lot of spaghetti westerns. So right, I really like the music too. I, I when I was doing poking around on IMDb about it, a lot of people complained about the music being out of place. I didn't think so. I didn't think so either. Uh, it was a little repetitive. You had the main theme here and there, but I I liked the main theme. Uh, I especially liked the bit with just the piano when they're they're rehearsing where they're just playing the main theme on the piano. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That re worked really well for me. Like it, it really kind of slowed down, uh, not slowed down, but maybe the way that piano music kind of made its way into the film, it really kind of made you, I don't know. It disarmed you a little bit more and is that, opened you up more for the, I don't know if I'm making any sense or not. I, I don't even, I might not even cut up. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I get what you're saying. Yeah. But. <laughs> Good podcasting. Um, <laughs> wow. We're on fire tonight, Derek. <laughs> we, we are. This is why I wanted to do my show first so that I was warmed up for yours. Oh man. The music. Good. It works where it needs to work. It's a little repetitive in spots, but same with the movie we're going to talk about for your show. So, you know, whatever. Uh, but I, I really like that. I love the the thing with the castle being brought down. On top. That's that's what that, I'm going to go back to. I'm going to use that in something. I don't know what, but I'm definitely using that in something. <laughs> it's really good. And I I love when the, the second secondary male lead crawls out of it off screen, basically. But you see him come up the stairs from behind and his back's just all covered in, like, gravel and yeah. dust and and he's yeah. like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's still available out there. And listeners, I, I would recommend it. I feel like, and I should watch it in dubbed, but I feel like this is the kind of movie you can put on dubbed, like in the background at a Halloween party. You know, that oh, sort yeah. of thing. It's got some music. It's got some dancing. It's got some pretty girls. It's got some gruesomeness. You know, it's going to set the mood. It's a great Halloween movie. I think it's going to be in our, our spooky month rotation for years right. to come. Right on. And it looks like Halloween was actually the release date of the film. Oh, so wow. That's pretty cool. It was released here in the States on October 31st, if the internet is to be believed. Who would lie on the internet? I know, right? Like, the internet never lies. Ugh. So I was doing some checking, and yeah, I did buy it in 2018, along with Dr. Blood's Coffin and Night of the Lepus. So apparently, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. Um <laughs> <laughs> Triple feature. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Night of the Lepus. I haven't seen that in a long time. We, we, oh, boy. <laughs> we watched Frogs recently. Mm. It was on Sven Gulli. It was like Sven Gulli covered that, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, It's one of the few things that I miss. I cut the cord when I moved, so I don't have cable anymore, which means I don't have MeTV, so I'm not getting my Sven Gulli uh, on my DVR. We're lucky we have an over-the-air affiliate. We don't do cable either. We just have an antenna in the window. And we get like 30 channels and me TV is one of them. So, you know, now that I'm in Vancouver, I should check to see what I can get in. Cause when I was in Oregon, I couldn't get much. No, we, huh. we get some really good stuff. We get me TV. We get a uh, comet. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I am. Uh, I think comet, you can actually stream off their website. Too. Yes. So listen to some, check out comet. Comet's got some good stuff. They, every summer on the summer holidays, so like 4th of July and 
Memorial Day, they do a Godzilla marathon. Yeah. That's always a good time. That's they did one, one for of, New Year's Eve, too. Oh, good. That's one of the things <laughs> I miss about the L Ray Network, is they would do Kai July 4th. Yeah. Pour one out for the L Ray Network. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was awesome. Anyway. We are way off track, which probably is a sign <laughs> that we should probably start wrapping up. It is still available. It's 20 bucks. Link in the show notes. Go pick it up for yourself. It's, it's, it's not that expensive. The buy-in is real easy. It's fun. It's, it's a very fun movie, and it's a great one to, to have on. If you want to put together like a program of late 50s, early 60s vampire movies. Yeah. It's it's a great one to just kind of pack in the middle there. I, I think we did that. I think that was the night we watched it. We did uh, back in October. We did like the horror of Dracula and I want to say Return of the Vampire. Ooh, I love that one too. So. Mm, that's yeah. a good one too. Talk about a good vampire death. Yes. Oh, that one's great. <laughs> All right. So we need to have people check this one out and check out your podcast. Once again, yes. it is called Record All Monsters. Where's the best place to find it online? We've been most active on our social medias. We have at Monsters Record on Twitter, uh, at recordallmonsters.pod on Instagram. You can find all of that on our website, which I need to update again. All our links are on our website, which is recordallmonsters.wordpress.com, I think. It might be recordallmonsters.pod. Uh, let's see. I've got recordallmonsterspod.wordpress.com. That's what it is. There we go. There are links to your Twitter, your Instagram, your store. I, I love the artwork that you've put together. That whole series of t-shirts that you did. Uh, I've got the King Kong one, and I love it. Uh, but you've got all the classic mon, all the classic giant monsters there, or at least a handful of them, and it looks great. You have the giant... I didn't realize you had the giant claw. Yeah! Ah, oh, dude! <laughs> We, we, I've been as we cover the movies. I'm trying to put uh, something related to one of the monsters, and it, and if one has enough nicknames throughout the movie, it it gets one of those circle of name shirts. The giant claw. How could I resist? A bird as big as a battleship. <laughs> I was tempted to just put battleship all around it. <laughs> but. That's great, man. That's so cool. So yeah, links in the show notes, listeners. Check that out. I love your remember that monsters are your friends kind of slogan. I love that. Uh, it's just some good stuff, man. Good stuff. And I wish you the best of luck with your podcast. I think you've been knocking it out of the park. I can't wait to see how season two plays out. Not just because I'm going to be on it. And yeah, just keep it up. And you are welcome here anytime, sir. Well, thank you, Derek. And you, likewise for you on Record All Monsters. You say that. We just haven't recorded my episode yet. You may <laughs> change your mind by the time that's over. <laughs> I'll end on that, actually. That's a good... <laughs> <laughs> Night of the Lepus. Rated PG. In this secret laboratory deep down in the bowels of the earth, this man carries out his fiendish research. Dr. Blood, murderer, who experiments with the hearts of his victims. Dr. Blood, the evil genius who robs the graves of their dead in the name of science. I'd like you to analyze whatever's in that needle, Doctor. It could tell us what happened to George Beale. Looks as though he's, though he's been kidnapped. Of course, that could explain the other disappearances. What on earth is this? It's a, a container for a, a narrow poison made by the natives of South America. Oh. Curare. Starring Karen Moore as Dr. Blood, who searches for the secret of reincarnation. You can't let a man die so that you can discover something. It doesn't matter how important it is. That is murder. Well, everywhere men are dying. Great men, philosophers, artists, scientists. But if they could live on, look how they could contribute to the advancement of man. Trugay is going to help me prove that I can give life where there was death. Hazel Court as Linda, who watches a man become a monster before her frightened eyes. I think we want to go back. No, you're going to stay here locked away with me forever. Oh, Peter, you scare me. I'm serious. You must remain within these dank walls for all eternity. 
Eon Hunter is the father who unknowingly helps to destroy his own son. Did you find out what was in that needle? Strychnos toxifera. Comini call curare. Dr. Blood's coffin, the gripping drama of a man who calls on the power of the devil to satisfy his insatiable lust for the secrets of life and death. Yes. I've done it. But I wanted to create something worthwhile. You haven't brought Steve Parker back to life. This is something from hell. The coffin opens and terror reaches out from beyond the grave. As the twins of evil evoke the power of vampirism and witchcraft. Twins of evil, they use the satanic power of their bodies to turn men and women into their blood slaves. Twins of evil. Rated R, under 17, not admitted without parent. That brings us to the end of this episode of Monster Kid Radio. As I always say, thank you. And I mean it each and every time I say it. Thank you for listening to the show. Thank you for retweeting treats and sharing, po- retweeting tweets and sharing the posts on Facebook. That's it. Retweeting tweets and sharing posts on Facebook and just spreading the word about Monster Kid Radio and helping us to grow the Monster Kid Radio family, the group, the the collection of people that we have here that all come together under the umbrella of Monster Movies. I love interacting with each and every one of you, whether it's here on the podcast, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or Discord, or on the Twitch channel, which has been a lot of fun lately. We actually did a bonus Twitch stream just the other night, and I'm going to keep doing that because that was a lot of fun. You can find it at twitch.tv slash monsterkidradio. Of course, we've got the big show, the big stream on Saturday, starting at 11 a.m. with the pre-show, courtesy of Scott the Amazing Morris. And we have the movies that start around noon. Please allow me to cut in here. So... It's been brought to my attention that this week's episode of the podcast went out without my intro or outro, or as I call them on my computer when I'm recording, my ins and outs. So I am re-releasing the episode this week with the ins and outs that were originally recorded included. However, this episode is going out on a Sunday. This update is going out on Sunday, which means that the Saturday stream that I was just about to mention in the outro, in the outs portion of the show, has already happened. So let me tell you about next week's stream over at twitch.tv slash monsterkidradio. It is the Scary Sword and Sandal stream. We're going to be showing Peplum movies that all have a spooky monster element in them. So we're talking about movies like Hercules in the Haunted World. We're talking about movies like The Love of Hercules. yes. Trust me, it's got a Hydra, it's got monsters in it, and it's got Jane Mansfield, but it's got monsters in it, and that's cool too. So that's coming up. Also, I know this audio quality sounds a little different, that's because I'm using my headset mic as opposed to my actual microphone that I normally use to podcast, and that's because my computer is in a state of um, kind of sort of disrepair right now. It's not broken, I mean, I'm obviously recording this and everything, but I had my computer guy come over yesterday, we tore part of it apart because we are installing a new video card and in the process we unplugged all the usb cables and for whatever reason when i plug the microphone back in that i normally use the computer's not recognizing that i will deal with that later in the meantime it's important to me to get this updated episode of 556 out to let you know that we are doing the stream next saturday with these scary sword and sandal movies so that's coming up my apologies for releasing the show without the ins and outs Let's get back to what I originally recorded now. Twitch.tv slash Monster Kid Radio. Of course, links to everything that I've mentioned here. The Discord, the Twitter, the Facebook, everything else. It's all on our website at monsterkidradio.net, as well as our contact information. You can call and leave a voicemail for Monster Kid Radio at 503-810-5MKR. That's 503-810-5657. Or you can send an email to the podcast. MonsterKidRadio at gmail.com is the email address. That's MonsterKidRadio at gmail.com. You know what else you can find on our website? A post about what's coming up next. Next week. 
We're recording with Steve Turek. I know, I got to have him back on the show. We're going to talk about a movie that he and I have been talking about for a little while now. This is a particular favorite of his. It's a regional film. It came out in 1978, so it's a little outside of our wheelhouse. However, the DIY is full on display here, which definitely has my interest. It's The Alien Factor from director Don Doler. I don't know as much about Don Doler as I probably should, considering he was kind of a groundbreaking or very important regional filmmaker and really impacted quite a few filmmakers that are working today. So I'm excited to get into The Alien Factor with Steve Turek next week. What's coming up after that? Not sure. You just have to come back next week to find out what's coming up the week after that and then after that and after that. You know, I'm trying to get a little bit more on top of scheduling. It's been a little different now that I am almost done with the unpacking, but I do have some pretty big plans for later this year. Stay tuned. Until all of those plans come to fruition, though, remember, the Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio, LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio, LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 Unported License. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song Moon Relay. That is copyright The Cron Chong Devils. 2014. You can find that at cronchongdevils.bandcamp.com. It's from their album Action. And I probably ought to spell that out for you. K-R-O-N-T-J-O-N-G devils.bandcamp.com. Just follow the link in the show notes and let them know that Monster Kid Radio sent you. My name is Derek M. Cook. I'll talk to everybody next week when we get into the alien factor with Steve Turek. Ciao. (laughs) 